Chapter 22, The Poor of the World. To Supply the Wants of the Poor. All around us we see want and suffering. Families are in need of food. Little ones are crying for bread. The houses of the poor lack proper furniture and bedding. Many live in mere hovels, which are almost destitute of conveniences. The cry of the poor reaches to heaven. God sees, God hears. Testimonies, Volume 6, page 385. While God in His providence has laden the earth with His bounties and filled its storehouses with the comforts of life, want and misery are on every hand. A liberal providence has placed in the hands of His human agents an abundance to supply the necessities of all, but the stewards of God are unfaithful. In the professed Christian world there is enough expended in extravagant display to supply the wants of all the hungry and clothe the naked. Many who have taken upon themselves the name of Christ are spending His money for selfish pleasure, for the gratification of appetite, for strong drink and rich dainties, for extravagant houses and furniture and dress, while to suffering human beings they give scarcely a look of pity or a word of sympathy. What misery exists in the very heart of our so-called Christian countries? Think of the condition of the poor in our large cities. In these cities there are multitudes of human beings who do not receive as much care and consideration as are given to the brutes. There are thousands of wretched children, ragged and half-starved, with vice and depravity written on their faces. Families are herded together in miserable tenements, many of them dark cellars reeking with dampness and filth. Children are born in these terrible places. Infancy and youth behold nothing attractive, nothing of the beauty of natural things that God has created to delight the senses. These children are left to grow up molded and fashioned in character by the low precepts and wretchedness and the wicked example among them. They hear the name of God only in profanity. Impure words and fumes of liquor and tobacco Moral degradation of every kind meet the eye and pervert the senses. And from these abodes of wretchedness, piteous cries for food and clothing are sent out by many who know nothing about prayer. By our churches there is a work to be done of which many have little idea, a work as yet almost untouched. I was in hunger, Christ says, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Matthew 25, 35, and 36. Some think that if they give money to this work, it is all they are required to do, but this is an error. Donations of money cannot take the place of personal ministry. It is right to give our means, and many more should do this. But according to their strength and opportunities, personal service is required of all. The work of gathering in the needy, the oppressed, the suffering, the destitute, is the very work which every church that believes the truth for this time should long since have been doing. We are to show the tender sympathy of the Samaritan in supplying physical necessities, feeding the hungry, bringing the poor that are cast out to our homes, gathering from God every day grace and strength that will enable us to reach the very depth of human misery and help those who cannot possibly help themselves in doing this work, we have a favorable opportunity to set forth Christ, the Crucified One. Testimonies, Volume 6, page 274 and 276. Begin by helping your neighbors. Every church member should feel it his special duty to labor for those living in his neighborhood. Study how you can best help those who take no interest in religious things. As you visit your friends and neighbors, show an interest in their spiritual as well as their temporal welfare. Present Christ as a sin-pardoning Savior. Invite your neighbors to your home and read with them from the precious Bible and from books that explain its truths. This united with simple songs and fervent prayers, will touch their hearts. Let church members educate themselves to do this work. This is just as essential as to save the benighted souls in foreign countries. 
while some feel the burden of souls afar off, let the many who are at home feel the burden of precious souls around them and work just as diligently for their salvation. The hours so often spent in amusement that refreshes neither body nor soul should be spent in visiting the poor, the sick, and the suffering, or in seeking to help someone who is in need. In trying to help the poor, the despised, the forsaken, do not work for them, mounted on the stilts of your dignity and superiority, for in this way you will accomplish nothing. Become truly converted, and learn of him who is meek and lowly in heart. We must set the Lord always before us, as servants of Christ keep saying, lest you forget it, I am bought with a price. God calls not only for our benevolence, but for our cheerful countenance, cheerful, hopeful words, the grasp of our hands. As you visit the Lord's afflicted ones, you will find some from whom hope has departed. Bring back the sunshine to them. There are those who need the bread of life. Read to them from the word of God. Upon others there is a soul sickness that no earthly balm can reach or physician heal. Pray for these and bring them to Jesus. On special occasions, some indulge in sentimental feelings which lead to impulsive movements. They may think that in this way they are doing great service for Christ, but they are not. Their zeal soon dies, and then Christ's service is neglected. It is not fitful service that God accepts. It is not by emotional spasms of activity that we can do good to our fellow men. Spasmodic efforts to do good often result in more injury than benefit. Give the right kind of help. Methods of helping the needy should be carefully and prayerfully considered. We are to seek God for wisdom, for He knows better than short-sighted mortals how to care for the creatures He has made. There are some who give indiscriminately to everyone who solicits their aid. In this they err. In trying to help the needy, we should be careful to give them the right kind of help. There are those who, when helped, will continue to make themselves special objects of need. They will be dependent as long as they see anything on which to depend. By giving undue time and attention to these, we may encourage idleness, helplessness, extravagance, and intemperance. When we give to the poor, we should consider, Am I encouraging prodigality? Am I helping or injuring man? No man who can earn his own livelihood has a right to depend on others. The proverb, The world owes me a living, has in it the essence of falsehood, fraud, and robbery. The world owes no man a living who is able to work and gain a living for himself. But if one comes to our door and asks for food, we should not turn him away hungry. His poverty may be the result of misfortune. We should help those who, with large families to support and constantly to battle with feebleness and poverty. Many a widowed mother with her fatherless children is working far beyond her strength in order to keep her little ones with her and provide them with food and clothing. Many such mothers have died from overexertion. Every widow needs the comfort of hopeful, encouraging words, and there are very many who should have substantial aid. Testimonies, Volume 6, page 227 and 228. Take note of every case of need. It is God's purpose that the rich and the poor shall be closely bound together by the ties of sympathy and helpfulness. He bids us interest ourselves in every case of suffering and need that shall come to our knowledge. Think it not lowering to your dignity to minister to suffering humanity. Many, not of our faith, are longing for the very help that Christians are in duty bound to give. If God's people would show a genuine interest in their neighbors, many would be reached by the special truths for this time. Nothing will or ever can give character to the work like helping the people just where they are. The Best Way to Reach Hearts Today by showing an interest in the wants of suffering humanity, we can best reach hearts. The culture of the mind and heart is much more easily accomplished when we feel such tender sympathy in others that we scatter our benefits and privileges to relieve their necessities. 
Letter 116, 1897. We want to represent Christ by reaching out to others. We are to work under the commission Christ gave to his disciples. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. This then is our work to reach the people who are neglected and win them to Christ. Until recently, our people have made but little or no effort to help these. Christ came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He would have every soul regard the efficacy of his blood as of unlimited value, able to save unto the uttermost all who will be persuaded to come to him. He would have every individual of our race formed in his image, Remember that God is infinite, and that his love revealed in the atonement of Christ in favor of all mankind makes manifest the value he places on humanity. He bids them come to him and be saved. To the source of all our mercies we must come. He will use them as his agents to win their fellow men from sin. Letter 33, 1898.